Huh, how you doing tonight, Crossing? Yeah. Oh man, this is, this, the, like, you stressed me out a little bit. <laughs> tonight we're talking about stress, so, like, <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Like, for real, like I, like, I have been writing a talk on how to handle stress for the past two weeks once I realized I have to talk on stress. And the more I wrote about stress, the more stressed I became. <laughs> Anybody ever start looking at all the stresses you have and you're like, holy cow, am I stressed out? Anybody ever had that happen before? Because if you start to actually list all the things you're responsible for, all of a sudden it gets a little, it gets a little crazy. So we're doing, this, we're doing this series called Can I Ask That? And the number one question you asked was, how do I figure out God's plan for my life? We talked about that last week. Second biggest question people had was, how do I handle all my stress? Now, I'm just asking the question, how many of you think that probably a couple hundred years ago there was less stress in the world than there is today? Can I see your hands? I would think so. Like I, I look at, like you've got like, uh, if you're a farmer, you got like crops or no crops, you either plant or don't plant. But the amount of stress that's in the, like the modern age is way different. And what we're gonna talk about tonight is like, like what does stress look like for us? In fact, I'm gonna give you a definition for stress. I'm gonna put it on the screens for you. It's in your note sheet too. But can you put that on the screen for me? Stress is this, the state or mental or emotional strain or tension resulting from adverse, or very demanding circumstances. That sounds like my whole life. <laughs> like, look at the, set, like the, the state or mental, emotional strain or tension resulting from adverse or very demanding. That's, that's, how many of you say that's your whole life? Can I see your hands? Like, most of, of, most of us don't live easy lives. Most of us have, like, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of stuff that we're responsible for. Teenagers got a lot of stress. Adults have a lot of stress. I think kids are under more stress than ever before. And so in talking about stress, like, I actually, I actually like, found out the major seven stressors. And what I did was after I wrote them down, I got honest with myself. So you know, like, um, in certain versions of Christianity, like, you go in the little booth and you say, um, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned, and then you confess. Um, I'm going to do a confessional tonight publicly. <laughs> in fact, um, these are the seven major stressors that, the, that, or that, that people say are in life today. Like, and they're not the same as they were 100 years ago. Uh, provision, time to get it all done, congestion, indecision, tough seasons, relational tension, and worry. Like, these are kind of the major things people stress about. And I got to thinking, like, do I, do I fit the category? And this is, like, I want you to think about, I'm, I'm going to just confess, and I want you to think about whether or not you fit any of these categories. So provision. I stress about my own personal finances. I stress about how the church is going to pay its bills. I stress about the fact that I'm responsible for all the families on staff to make sure they get paid and they pay all their bills. I stress about um, how, how we're gonna actually have more people to reach. I stress about uh, the cost, like maybe you don't stress about this, but I do. I stress about the cost of insurance, the cost of medical coverage. I stress about gas prices because I live in St. Paul and I drive here. Uh, I stress about paying for my kids' college education. I stress about my uh, kids that just got married and whether they're gonna be provided for and taken care of. I stress about my kids' future. Once I'm gone someday, are they gonna be taken care of? Like I have like all, like just provision alone, like I'm immediately like surrounded with stress. Time to get it all done. I stress about all the stuff I have to do at work because ministry is a giant black hole. There's always more problems because there's more people. More people, more problems. <laughs> That's just the reality. Uh, there's always more people to help. I stress about all the stuff that uh, Kelly wants me to do around the house that I keep forgetting to do, like, like wash my sink out. And I, I finally washed my sink out yesterday. I, okay, good. And I cleaned the toilet yesterday. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing well. <laughs> uh, I stress about, uh, like in terms of getting it all done, I stress about time with my kids, uh, especially when they don't necessarily want to spend so much time with me because now they're teenagers and like adults and like they got other lives. They're trying to like, so like, how am I going to figure out time with my, with my kids? I stress about uh, time for my marriage and time for my parents as they age. I stress about like time for my friends and whether they're going to feel like I'm blowing them off again when I say no another time when they say, hey, do you want to go do this? And I just don't have the time. I stress about when I'm going to have time for me, when I'm going to have time to fish or read that book. Uh, I stress about getting the oil changed and the car washed. Like, how am I going to have time to pull all the weeds in the garden? Like, I'm stressing, like, about, like, I, there's so, like, I can't get all the stuff done that's on, like, I don't even have to-do lists because there's no point I would never get it done. I stress about congestion. Uh, I stress about crowds a lot. Did you know that in 1900, there was only one city in the entire world with a million people? That was London. 
today. Every city got a lot of people, <laughs> millions of people. So we're constantly stressing about crowds and traffic and standing in line. And you're standing in line at Walmart, you're like, okay, am I in the longer line or the short ones? If I just stand here long enough, I can figure out, and, like, and you feel like a fool if you end up in the wrong line long enough. <laughs> you try to be strategic about getting to the right place, right? You walk into the restaurant and there's, oh, I gotta wait how long for a seat? And then you finally get your seat and then you gotta wait how long for your food? And you do realize like 100 years ago, like people usually sat in a dinner for like three hours. And it was normal to be seated and your drinks would come and you'd spend 45 minutes to an hour just chatting. And then your food would come like a half an hour later. Like it was a three hour ordeal to go out to eat. That was normal. Now, man, if I don't get my food in 10 minutes, what's wrong with the waiter? What's like, it's because we're so surrounded by crowds and lines and we just, we're constantly tense because everything just isn't fat, like, because there's so much and it's just kind of overwhelming. I'm stressed about indecision, man. I stress about the fact there are too many choices. When I go into the cereal aisle and there's 500 kinds of cereal, that's stupid. And why do I need 40 kinds of toothpaste? <laughs> like, that's stressful. I walk in the, like, toothpaste aisle, why can't there just be toothpaste? <laughs> Brush your teeth and, like, like, go to toothbrushes. And there's, like, 18 toothbrushes. I don't know. <laughs> so then you're standing in line looking at toothbrushes. <laughs> I told you, I'm just thinking about me. Maybe you're not as weird as me. I stress about, in terms of indecision, I stress about whether to start another campus or not, I stress about when to start a service. I stress about when to take a vacation so I don't hurt the church attendance. Because I know every time I take a vacation, man, I know the attendance drops. So I'm like, when should I go on vacation? Everybody else just goes when they want. But if I go with the wrong season, it hurts the whole place. So then I'm like, should I go? Should I stay? Should I stay or should I go? <laughs> Tough seasons. I stress about my health. I stress about getting older. I stress about my weight. I stress about my mind staying sharp. I stress about my cholesterol. I stress about the death of the people I love. I stress about every person that stops coming to church. I stress over my friendships that die. I stress that, we have, that when we have to shut down a ministry or something fails in church life. I stress over every failure and every bad day and every setback. And then there's the relational tension that I face. I stress about whether people are gonna like me. I have to like present a term paper every weekend in, for, in front of several hundred people. <laughs> and you either go, or eh. You don't just present it to one person, you just present it to like a thousand people here in a term paper. And they just, they rate you every week. That's stressful. <laughs> I stress about people's criticism. I stress about whether I smiled enough or whether I look like I frowned. I stress out whether or not like, people feel like, like I noticed them or that I heard their conversation. I stress about the personal attacks on my family. When someone makes fun or lies or gossips about me and my wife or my kids. I stress about the people who when I text them or call them and they avoid my phone call or they don't respond to my text and I'm like, what did I do now? Ever been there? And then I just... To be really honest, I worry a lot. Well, what happens if that doesn't work? And what about this? And what if that doesn't happen? And like sometimes I really literally, like I'll get in my head, I just wonder if the other shoe's gonna drop. Like things are going so good, they're going so well. And sometimes you just kinda like, oh my gosh, is the other shoe just gonna drop randomly? And all of a sudden, the leg, the, my legs are gonna get cut out from under me and I'm just gonna sit there and go, what just happened? This is just me, this is just my life, my story. But I would guess that I am not much different than you. Like, like I have a different job, but I would guess you deal with just as much tension. Who would agree with that, can I see your hands? Yeah. Um, and then as I was studying all this, I realized that our stress causes a lot of health issues. So ongoing chronic stress, which is what I just read, can cause or exasperate many health issues, including 
mental health problems, depression, anxiety, personal disorder, uh, personality disorders, cardiovascular disease, including heart disease, high blood pressure, abnormal heart, heart rhythms, heart attacks, and stroke. And now I'm just stressed about stress. <laughs> I wasn't stressed about all the stress, but then I read that, and now I'm just stressed about the fact that we're talking about stress. <laughs> And I got to thinking about how stress works, and this is kind of my little illustration. If you end up empty, this is an empty pop can, and the pressure builds, it doesn't take much for something to get broken or crushed. But if you're full of the right stuff, I'm not sure Diet Coke is the right stuff, but, <laughs> but if you're full of the right stuff, you can handle a lot of the stuff that I just talked about. And this is where the word comes in. See, what I wanna do tonight is I wanna show you how this word can give you the ability to stand up under the pressure. Because what we're always trying to do is how to get out from under the pressure, but the pressure isn't going away. Like, until you're dead, the pressure gonna be there. So you have to figure out a way to fill yourself up with the right stuff so that you can handle the mounting pressure on your life. It might change over time, but the heaviness and the weight is never going away until you pass away. So you might as well figure out a way to fill yourself up with the right stuff so you can handle the pressure. So tonight, here's what we're gonna do. I'm just gonna give you Seven habits for handling stress from Psalm chapter 23. And I'm really hoping you take notes on this because I hope, like maybe all seven of these are not your thing, but here's the thing. Uh, the seven habits that are found in Psalm 23 are directly in relationship to the seven things I just named. It's like God knows your stress and he goes, boom, here's how you combat it. And he knows the next stress and he, boom, here's how you combat it. Psalm 23 is the most... Uh, known Old Testament passage, like in all, in all the Bible, it's the one that, the, that they read at funerals. But if you read it in the context of what you stress out about, it'll help you. So I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna walk it through. Jesus, man, I'm grateful to be in your house. The pressure of preaching is, gr is real and it is great, but I also love it. I believe you filled me up tonight to help people handle the pressure they face. May this give them strength to endure. May it give them confidence and boldness and peace. And may anxiety and worry be bound in the name of Jesus. May your place, may every heart be filled with your peace and filled with your strength so we can handle whatever it is we face. Everybody say, my heart's open. My mind's ready. Make me better, God. Transform me by your word. I'm open to whatever. Bring it on. In Jesus' name. Amen. So when I, first, when, I, when I was a young pastor and first started dealing with this kind of stuff, honestly, like the pastor that I would look to for a lot of guidance and counsel was named Rick Warren. Um, pastor Rick uh, wrote the Purpose Driven Church, and then Purpose Driven Life, and then much of our church was kind of built around some of his concepts. And in studying Psalm 23, like I found a, I, I found a teaching from Pastor Rick that basically is where a lot of this information comes from. And I want you to know that. Like, it's not like I'm not smart enough to figure it out. I just have gone, hey, Rick, you're smart. That came from Jesus. I'll take it and use it. And I've been using this for a while now, and I hope it helps you. So let's, talk, let's start right away with the, 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 the stress of provision. Come on, say the stress of provision. This is how God answers the stress of like, hey, I don't know if I'm going to have enough. Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my, I shall not. Habit number one, you look to God alone to take care of you and to meet your needs. Come on, say God alone. God alone. The government does not meet your needs. They never are going to. The more you worry, the more you stress, the more you vote, and they're never going to actually come through for you. The government can't do what you want it to do. They're not God. Like, people around you, if you expect your spouse to meet all your needs, oh my gosh, that's too much pressure on Kelly. She's not God, she can't meet all my needs. If I'm looking at her for attention and love and like fulfillment all the time, she's gonna be like, you're stressing me out. <laughs> I'm actually gonna give her stress by trying to make her meet all my needs. So I have to decide that people can't meet my needs, the government can't meet my needs, my paycheck can't meet all my needs. Like we'll just think of it this way. Like as a preacher, the only way I'm getting paid is if people give money in the offering. 
So if every week I'm like, oh my gosh, what are people gonna give? Like then I'm stressed out about that. Like the, the paycheck, my paycheck doesn't come from the offering. My check, paycheck comes from him. And yours is not any different. Whatever business you have, whatever, whatever place you work in, it's not that business that provides your needs. God loves you and he wants to provide your needs. He is a good shepherd who will provide. This is who takes care of us. And when you're thinking this way, you're not so worried about your business, you're not so worried about your workplace, you're not so worried about your paycheck, you're like, this is gonna be all right. Now, I'm gonna use David, because he says the Lord is my shepherd. Remember, David's the shepherd. When he writes Psalm 23, here's where he's at. Go ahead and put that on the screen for me. Um, this is what is known as the Valley of the Shadow. Every time we take a trip to Israel, this is the, like one of the places we go, um, he probably wrote that psalm someplace on the top of that hill where that radio tower's at. There are no green, there's no green grass. There ain't no still water. <laughs> there's nothing beautiful or like it's just this big, it's like, I mean, it's like, it's like being on Mars or something. I mean, there's nothing there. And he's like, nope, the Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I want. Like, dude, you got nothing. No, I'm good. See, you can either believe God's gonna provide for you in lousy circumstances or not, but this is gonna determine whether you have the, the ability to handle the pressure you're under. This is how uh, Paul writes it in Romans chapter eight, verse 32, he says this, since God did not spare even his own son for us, but gave him up for us. God didn't even spare his own kid. Won't he most surely give us everything else we what? So most of you, if, you, if I was to say, uh, who are you trusting him to get to heaven? Most of you be like, oh, I'm trusting Jesus. Well, then why can't you trust him to meet your needs is basically what he just said. If you can trust him with heaven, why can't you trust him with today? Oh, but look at my bank account or, 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 or look at this bill or, or look at the way that my business is going. No, no, no. You just say, God is my shepherd. He will meet my needs. The cross says God provides no matter what. Second verse, Psalm chapter 37, verse 25. One of my stressors that I have a lot is, will my kids be taken care of? Every parent worries about their kids. They're gonna get the education they're supposed to have. Are they gonna get into the college they wanna go to? Or are they gonna get the job they need? Are they gonna marry the right person? Are they gonna end up with the wrong situation? And like, you just stress about your kids. Like, it's just, it just happens because they're your kids. And this verse gives me comfort about their provision. Psalms 37, 25, I have been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous abandoned or his children begging for bread. Every weekend in church we say we are totally what? Righteous. We're totally what? Righteous. If you are righteous, your kids are okay. If you are a child of the king, I want you to understand he's gonna take care of your kids too. Like some of you come to me like, but I don't know if my, my kids aren't following Christ. Like train up a child in the way he should go and when he's old he won't depart from it. You just keep going, okay, I did the best I could to raise him and point him in the right direction and her in the right direction. Eventually they're gonna figure it out. God cares about them more than I do. He is their shepherd too. Habit number one, provision. God's my shepherd, nothing else. My needs are met, it's gonna be fine. You just start saying that to yourself every time you get the bill or you face the situation or your business doesn't seem like it's going well, you'll move to a better direction. You can handle the pressure. Secondly, the stress of not enough time to get it all done. Here's how the next part goes. Psalm 23 verse two just says, he makes me, what's the next two words? Come on, say lie down. In green pastures. Habit number two, obey God's instructions about rest. Now, this is the hard one but I have so much to do. I got work stuff to do and home stuff to do and family stuff to do and kids stuff to take care of. I have so much to do. And his instruction is, he makes me lie down. Whew. Habit number two, just obey his instructions about rest. Do you know how, much, how important it was that you rest? He put it in the 10 commandments. Don't kill people or cheat on your wife. <laughs> oh, and by the way, take a day off. <laughs> Like he put don't kill people and take a day off in the same category. <laughs> it must be really important. Like, oh no, it's really important I don't kill people. It's really important I don't cheat on my wife. Oh, but I don't need to take a day off. Yes, you do. <laughs> Ever been around a two-year-old when they haven't had enough sleep? You just need to go to bed. <laughs> Lay down. 
There's a lot of cranky adults the same way, and God would say, just take a break. In fact, this is Exodus chapter 34, verse 21. Six days are set aside for work, but every seventh day you, sh- you must rest. What's the next word? Completely. Completely. And then he, he's going to throw in a statement that I haven't used in service in a long time. Even during your seasons of plowing and harvest. Remember, this is, a, this is a culture of farming. That's the busiest season of the year. Once it's planted, we're cool. Once it's harvested, we done. The only time that's big, plowing and harvesting. And he's like, in your busiest season, even then, you take a day and observe rest. I, I, one time, I, when I was early, like early in my, uh, my pastor stuff, a guy, a guy at church, he just told me a story after service one day. He was like, so I heard this from a friend. He said, uh, have you ever tried to chop down a tree with an ax? You start hacking on the tree and hacking on the tree and hacking on the tree. And then eventually the ax gets dull. You're like, oh, I don't have time. I gotta get the, I gotta get the tree chopped down. I gotta get the, and you just keep hacking. But if your ax is dull, it's gonna take you twice as long. So what do you do? You stop and rest and sharpen the ax and it will actually go faster to chop the tree down rather than slower. Same is true with you and all the stuff you want to get done. If you would just take one day off a week, no matter what, you take the day off, you will get more done in six than you ever can in seven. And I'm talking, that doesn't mean, oh, I'm not working my job, so I'm going to go home and work. No, no, no. Literally just take one day off a week. And do nothing, like, this is actually what Sabbath is for. I want you to write down these three R's. Relaxation, recreation, and recharging. The reason why God wants us to take one day off a week is first of all, just to relax. God cares about your life enough, he wants you to relax. If you would relax, you'd be less stressed out. Secondarily, recreation, go do something fun that you love. If you're gonna do things on your day off, go do something fun. And then last, recharging. The purpose is to recharge your soul, so you come to worship, and to recharge you physically, so you enjoy the day, just hanging out, doing what you love. And in this way, if you're physically and spiritually recharged, I bet you'll get more done in six days than you ever could in seven. But you've got to decide, I'm just not, like, I, I won't work that hard. I'm just not going to do it. It doesn't make a difference what the season is. I'm taking a day off. Like, we just do. Like, our, we are ruthless as a family. i just not going to work seven days a week. I'm not going to do it. Life is bigger than work. And there are people to help and stuff to do. And what about that, what, that person? Like, you know what? You're going to have to wait 24 hours. You know how many problems go away if you just wait 24 hours? <laughs> this is not a problem sometimes if you wait 24 hours. Uh, third one, the stress of congestion. Psalm chapter 23, two, two B and three A. He makes me lie down in green pastures. We just talked about that part. He leads me beside what? Still waters, he what? Restores my soul. Habit number three, get away, enjoy the beauty of nature. Now, 150 years ago, we wouldn't have to say this. That was normal. You were all stuck in nature. <laughs> You're trying to get out of nature. Now we have so insulated ourselves that nature isn't like the natural beauty of the world. We miss it so, so often. And it's simply because we insulate ourselves so, oh, I need to relax. I need to relax. So therefore, I'll just sit and watch Netflix, which can't recharge your soul. But nature can. Do you know the first thing that happened after God created Adam and Eve? He placed them where? in a garden. See, your body was made for a garden. Your mind was made for beauty. Like it was made to be in those places, not to just observe them, like observe them on a television or through a computer screen. Like you've got to decide, you know what, I'm just going to take a few hours and get away. Like, now this is different than like some of you are like, oh, I'll take a vacation then. Like, I'm not talking about, I'm taking two weeks to go someplace and then I'm gonna work my butt off for the rest of the year until I'm dead. <laughs> like literally, as part of your daily or your weekly routine, you're just taking time to go for a walk. You go hang out in your garden, maybe, maybe recharging you. Like, I actually like to pull weeds in my garden. Like, just a little bit, 20 minutes, like not like a long time, like 20 minutes. Just pull a few weeds, I'm hanging out in the garden, I got beautiful flowers, like, it's nice out, like, I love it. This is Jesus, like, do you remember Jesus is kind of smart. This is Jesus in Mark chapter 1. As, at evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all that were sick and those that were demon-possessed, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And then he healed many who were sick with various diseases, and he cast out demons, and he didn't allow, didn't allow any of the demons to speak because they knew him. Now, stop for a second. That's a busy day. They brought to him the entire city of sick people. 
Imagine every sick person in your world shows up at your doorstep and he's like, okay, got a job to do. And he's like gonna heal them all. That's a busy day. Now in the morning, after a really busy day, having risen a long time while before it was daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place. Where's he going? Off on a mountainside someplace. Off, off next to a stream someplace. Maybe sitting by the Sea of Galilee as the sun comes up. And as he sits there and rests in the world that God created, he suddenly has the ability to go about his day again. After experiencing stress, one of the best things you can do is just get away for a couple hours, go fishing, go kayaking, go for a bike ride, go for a walk, but don't be around more people, which many, causes many of you more stress, and don't plug in, unplug, because if you will unplug, the ability for your mind to relax and your body to relax goes way up. And it's only in the modern age we've ever had to talk about this. We just forget how we're built. We've had 10,000 years of human history and we've lived in nature and the last 100 years we haven't lived in it at all. And where's our stress gone? So if you just decide, you know what? Once a day I'm going for a walk. Like this morning, Kelly walked, I went kayaking. She walked around the little pond I was fishing in. <laughs> and she spent 45 minutes and I spent 45 minutes on the water and it was great. If I didn't have moments like that, I wouldn't like you very much. <laughs> because people stress me out. But when I get that kind of, that kind of filled up, then I can handle the pressure of whatever it is God's gonna put in front of me. And I can love them and I can be kind and gracious just because my heart's at rest. The next one, the, 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 the stress of indecision. Now how many of you, if you have too many choices to make, it really does bother you, can I see your hands? That's, that's, that's the worst for me. Like I, I don't like to go into grocery stores that are big. Like I'll go to Aldi because it's small. But I, I don't really go to Cub because if I walk into if I walk into Cub, like literally it's like ah, aisles of endless stuff. I've literally she sent me to the grocery store and said get a couple things for dinner, and I've walked around for 20 minutes and be like I don't know what to do, and I've actually been so stressed out I've left and not got anything. <laughs> it is really true. Like that's just because it's how like how I'm wired up. So I understand the stress of indecision. And this is what helps me. This is Psalm 23, verse 3b. He leads me on paths of righteousness. For his, name, his name's sake, habit number four, you just go to God for guidance. Come on, say go to God. Go to God for guidance. Now, we talked about this last week. We said, hey, God speaks through basically five ways. He, 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 he talks, like I gave you a whole bunch of stuff last week. This is the five major ways in which God wants to talk to you. But what I didn't give you is this one verse that we actually started the church with 14 years ago. In fact, I think I've only preached on the verse maybe twice in 14 years, but it's the, church, it's the verse we started the church on. It's how we got the, cross, the crossing name. It's Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. Here's what it says. This is what the Lord says. When you're, when you're trying to make a choice, we're trying to make a decision, stand at the crossroads. One of the translations actually says crossing. And I was like, that's a good church name. We actually got our church name based on this verse. Like, if you would go to a place of worship when you're trying to figure out like how do I make a decision about who to marry or job to take or house to buy or sell or whatever that kind of stuff is. Like just take a minute, go to worship, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. What are the ancient paths? Well, these are the ancient paths. Like somebody fill me up with the words so that I've got the word in so I can make a better choice. And then walk in it, you will find, and ask where the good way is, which would be wise counsel. Like you actually ask people that you trust in your place of worship. People you trust in your place of worship. What should I do about this? Do you know how many people have businesses in this room? They're like, I don't know how my business, my business succeed. I don't know how to start a business. There's tons of people who've already got that done. If you would just ask them here, oh my gosh, I bet you could move forward. Oh, I, I need to know how to, how to best to buy or sell a house. I need to know what's best to, how, to, how to raise my kids. Like there are people all over this room that are ahead of you at the game. And if you would just like, hey, I'm coming to worship. I'm looking in the word and I'm asking wise counsel. The reality is you would make better decisions. They're all over the place around you. And this is what I love. The last part of this phrase is awesome. And if you would just choose this for your life, you would find, what's that word? For your soul. 
God's like, hey, I don't, know what, like, I don't know what decision to make. I don't know what college to go to. I don't know who to marry. I don't know what job to take or what house to sell or buy. Like, the more you come to worship and the more you find people who have already been there and done that, you'll make wise choices. You'll make better decisions and you'll live at peace. It's pretty simple. How about the stress of tough seasons? Like, maybe you're facing... Like this isn't, by the way, uh, to be really fair, and I, I, I thought this when I wrote Tough Seasons, I think all, all of life is a tough season. If you're waiting for the season that's not tough, tough, you're gonna wait a long time. It's just there's different levels of tough, toughness. Sometimes you're facing health issues, sometimes you're facing job issues, sometimes you're facing, it's financial, but all of us, that ever, like every single one of you is in a season that is challenging, would you agree? And here's what he says. No matter what you're facing, loss, health issues, death, failure. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are, you are what? You are with me. Habit number five, trust God in the valley of the shadow. Do you know the shadow is usually bigger than the reality? Most of the time, there is not bad guys around every dark corner. But when you see the shadow, you're so, I wonder if there's a bad guy around the corner. The shadows scare you more because there's more shadows than there ever is reality. And so if you just kind of like go, you know what, like I get the fact that times are tough and I don't know what this is gonna mean and I don't know how this is all gonna work, but you know what, it's probably not gonna be as bad as I think it is. Probably gonna be better than I thought it was. You know what happens? Nine times out of 10, it gets better. Now, we all go through the valley of the shadow of death. Like there is death, there is pain, there is failure, but it's usually less than we have imaginations of. We tend to imagine the worst rather than believing the best. And if you looked at your bill and said, no, I'm gonna believe the best, God's got this. If you looked at your health issue and go, no, I'm gonna believe the best, God's got this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of death, of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Now, when he wrote the Valley of the Shadow of Death, this is where he was at. Like, this is, this, is, this is the actual Valley of the Shadow of Death. This path goes from Jericho to Jerusalem, and they called it the Valley of the Shadow of Death. You know why? Because in this little dark cavern, bandits would wait, rob people, take their stuff, beat them up, kill them. And so it was known as this place of terror, but it was the only path to Jerusalem from Jericho. In fact, in the story of the scriptures, the Good Samaritan story is based on this passage. The good, like the guy walks along this journey, gets beat up, two guys walk by and then the Good Samaritan helps him. It's in that, it's in that valley. Now, it's a scary place even to this day. A couple of Jewish teenagers were walking in that valley several years back and were killed by terrorists. Just recently. And what he says is when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Because there's a reality of something really terrifying in there. For you are, what's the next words? With me. So you have to decide that every time you go through a valley like that, you are never going through it alone. That there is always somebody with you in the, in the struggle, in the scary, in the weird, in the uncomfortable, in the what if, that you nev you've never faced a problem alone once you gave your life to Christ. That he goes through this stuff with you. In, one, in fact, one scripture passage says that every time you cry, and it says in all their distress, Isaiah says, he too was distressed with them. So that when you face pain and you face hardship, he's hurting right alongside you. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. Do not fear, for I am, what's the next two words? With you, do not be dismayed. Some of you need to hear this tonight. It's gonna be okay. You're not alone, you're not abandoned, you're not forsaken, you're not forgotten. You're not God's leftover. You're God's favorite. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I was going through something really hard in college. I don't remember what it was about. It was probably about a girl. <laughs> it's a bad day. But I came back to my dorm room one night and somebody had left that verse written out by hand on a little post-it note and stuck it on my desk. 
I kept that note for several years. I never found out who gave it to me. But I kept it, in, like, and it became one of the biggest verses of my life. For many years, it, like, it was the thing that got me through some really, really tough stuff. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you, and I will uphold you by my righteous right hand. Like, his right hand holding me up. His right hand holding you up. That's good. See, believing this gives you the courage, no matter what you face, to keep standing. But it's the struggle of believing it that causes all the pressure to crush you. You just have to believe he's going to do what he said he's going to do. Don't look at your problems. Look at the promiser. How about the stress of relational tension? Nobody's ever faced that. Your families are perfect. (laughs) You never have issues with your friends or crazy people at work. (laughs) Never happens. But in case it does, Psalm 23, 4 and 5. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You know what a rod, the rod and staff was for? It was like a baseball bat to protect them from the bad guys, to protect sheep. He used it to, like, it was kind of like carrying a sidearm. They didn't have a sidearm in those days, so they carried a rod and staff. They'd fight off, they'd fight off wolves with it. They'd fight off lions with it. He's like, hey, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They're going to protect me. In places of tension, you prepare a table before me, you prepare awesomeness in the presence of enemies. I'm going to enjoy good food and good wine and good friendships. All the people they mad at me, it don't mean nothing. I'll be just fine. I am protected by Christ. Habit six, just let God be your defender. Why don't you say that with me? Say, let God be my defender. Do you know what one of the hardest spirit, like this is, this is the difference between, in my mind, in many cases, the difference between spiritual maturity and spiritual immaturity. Immature people always have to defend themselves. I can't believe they said that while well, I'm saying this, and that's not true, and I got oh my gosh, I can't believe they think that, I can't believe, like you're constantly defending yourself. It's immaturity. As you grow up strong and confident in Christ, The more you believe that God is with you, the more you believe, man, he's my defender. I don't have to defend myself. How did Jesus handle being attacked? He said he didn't even fight back at all. In one one passage, he says, it says he did not even open his mouth to respond to the accusations. That's maturity. They get him in a room, people start lying about him, they start accusing him of all this kind of stuff. They say, what do you think of all this? Well, how do you want to defend yourself? And he just. Stays there. That's stupid, man. Uh, He's the only one that got up from the grave. (laughs) It seemed kind of smart. Like at the time it seemed weird, but it kind of worked out. See, I want you to understand that the more you like follow Jesus, following Jesus means you're going to become like Christ. Christ followers don't need to defend themselves. They don't need to fight back. They don't need to protect their reputation. God protects it just fine. And if they go, if something happens, and something happens, like, like the reality is, it's up to God. We trust ourselves to his care, and he's really good at defending us. In fact, um, I'm going to give you a quote from Pastor Rick Warren, because I told you, like, A lot of what I learned about stress management came from Rick. Here's what he says. It takes a lot of faith and humility to rest in God instead of taking matters into your own hands. You are more like Christ when you do not retaliate. Jesus remained silent when he stood falsely accused to be killed on the cross. Critics are the least important people in your life. Little people belittle people. They reveal the smallness of their dark hearts. Great people make you feel great. And you have to decide whether or not you're going to allow little people to ruin your life. It's not worth it. Come on, go live your life. Go enjoy it. Don't let little people wreck everything. Just go live your life. Do you know what the greatest testament to people who criticize you? He prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Woohoo! I'm just going to enjoy my life anyway. I'm ignoring him. But this takes faith that God will actually take care of you. 
He's bigger than little people. <laughs> In fact, one time somebody said this to me this is the way, and I thought this was pretty cool. They said, either God is big and people are small, or people are big and God is small. It's one or the other. Teenagers, I know that you go to, you go to school and like, Sometimes the culture at your school, I just talked to a couple guys today, like the culture of their school just sucks. Like the teachers are great, they're trying really hard, but there are people that are just rough. And you gotta trust that God's gonna take care of you, that God's gonna defend your reputation, that God's out for your best, that you can handle whatever comes your way, and that he will get you through, and you're gonna be okay. Come on, he's your defender, he's your protector. Is that good news? Psalms 18, verse one and two just says, how I love the Lord, you're my defender, my protector, my strong forces, fortress, and you I am safe, you protect me like a shield. See, every single th- one of the things that I wrote down about stressing about, God just responds with, trust me, trust me, trust me, trust me, I'll empower you, I'll strengthen you, I'll, I'll defend you, I'll take good, I love you, I'll take good care of you. You just have to trust that I'm your good shepherd. And that brings me to, to the last one the stress of worry. And all of us have like a different version of how worry stresses us out. Psalm 23, last part of it, you anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Habit number seven, worship God for his faithfulness. Now, David wrote that with no provision, in a valley of shadow, in a desert. And the last thing he writes is, surely goodness and mercy go follow me all the days of my life and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Man, it's gonna be awesome. Where I live is awesome. What I'm facing is awesome. Everything is awesome. (laughs) He says all that, even though it doesn't look great. Do you know what I need to tell some of you? Some of you, if things feel okay, you come to church. As soon as things start to fall apart, then you skip church. That's the time you need to be in the house even more. You need to decide God is faithful and God is good and God loves me and he's coming through for me no matter what you face. See, once again, maturity is I'm gonna worship him for being good even if I'm not seeing it yet. You know what happens? Eventually you're gonna see it. One of my favorite verses in the Old Testament for facing problems. Lamentations 3, 19. I remember my affliction, my suffering, and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I remember all the tough times I've been through. I remember them and my soul is super depressed and downcast within me. Yet, this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of God's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. What if tomorrow morning you got up and said, yeah, I know I'm facing this, but he's faithful. I know I'm facing this, but he's faithful. I know I'm facing that, he's faithful. Back when I was a kid in church, I never appreciated some of the old hymns as I've gotten older. They have meant more to me. And as I was writing that last point and thinking about that last verse, I got reminded of an old hymn. And just for a second, I'd like Pastor Ted and Kelly to just sing it for you. Just stay seated and listen. 